Bonjour, I'm Carol Forgash, and I want to thank the committee for inviting me to speak at this wonderful and prestigious conference. I hope to be with you all next year in March 2024. And I'll, today I'll be speaking to you about the treatment of complex trauma within an EMDR and ego state framework. And let me begin by paraphrasing Jung, who wisely said, know all the theories and master all the techniques, but as you touch a human soul, remember that you are also a human soul. And that's basically what we all need to be, is the human souls that are going to help our complex trauma clients not only survive, but be more of a thriver in today's lifetime. So don't forget to be yourself, as well as the skilled clinician you are, because it's your personality and your willingness to be an observer and a witness and a guide that are gonna help our clients who come to us with such a tremendous burden of problems stemming sometimes from childhood and long and persistent legacies of abuse and neglect. What we're gonna talk about is how to take EMDR therapy and weave it together with ego state therapy and the techniques of working with dissociation and provide an atmosphere of learning and growth that will most of all make our clients feel safe. And to illustrate that in the brief time I have with you today, I want to tell you the story about Amanda and the grunting child. Amanda called me a few years ago to tell me that she was referred to me by her psychiatrist after a recent hospitalization that was precipitated by her therapist initiating a sexual relationship with her. He referred her to a, a psychiatrist, psychologist he thought would be helpful, but when she got to his office, within minutes of meeting him, she was on the floor grunting as he described like an animal in tremendous distress. He eventually got her back off the floor onto the couch and she was able to tell him that she had no idea of what had just happened, but she couldn't see him anymore. And he said, I think you're right, and I'm gonna refer you to somebody who can help you with this problem that you're having, which is a dissociative disorder. And when she called, she was very uneasy about making another appointment with me, but I persuaded her to come in and at least stand in the doorway, as she said, maybe she couldn't enter my office at all. Well, she did come in and she sat down, but again, within minutes, she was on the floor making these very strange sounds. I sat quietly, just listening, and then I said, may I speak to Amanda? Maybe she and I can help you get off the floor. And she got back on the couch and Amanda said, what is that? What is happening to me? And I asked her what she knew about this phenomenon. She said, it's only happened in her brain before. All her life, she's heard that noise and she doesn't know what it means but she could tell me why it happened in the psychologist's office. And that's because her father, who had sexually abused her during her entire childhood, looked very much like the psychologist. And she agreed that being a woman, I might be a safer person to be with. I hoped that would be true for her. And we started talking about the idea of dissociation and parts and depersonalization, which she was very well aware of. She would hold out her hands to me and say, you see these hands? They look like a four-year-old's hands. They don't look like a grown woman's hands. I asked her if it was related to that little animal part that, who had come out before, and she said, I think it's not an animal. I think it's that little girl in terrible distress because of what her father's doing. And then she looked like she had dissociated once again, and I sat with her quietly a little longer, and she eventually came back. That was my introduction to working with people with complex trauma. And we had to figure out many ideas and techniques that we borrowed from other branches of the psychological services like ego state work, like how to end dissociation, how to minimize affect regulation. And some of the things we used were really quite funny and came out of my teaching career of elementary school teaching many years earlier. For example, I had objects in my office like this funny looking little thing and this soft squishy ball. And she looked at those things very often and said to me one day, did you ever think of using this for helping the eye movements in EMDR work? And I said, show me how, would you? And she went like this. She said, now just follow my fingers, as she heard me say. And I said, how do the parts feel about that? We hadn't done actual EMDR processing yet because that was for a stage when she was much more stabilized. But she was able to say, 
I think I could just follow this for a little bit. So I said, I tell you what, it's really important to establish a safe space for you to be able to relax, to meditate, to think. And sometimes we can enhance that by using eye movements once you've established the image in your mind. And she said, I have a place. I said, good. Now, let me know whether this deepens it or fades it away. I didn't want to say anything negative that might prejudice her thinking about that. And she said, that's a great idea. So I said, I'm going to go very slowly. You think about your safe space and let me know how that feels. She said, my heart feels warmer. I said, is that a good sign? She said, that's an excellent sign. Could we do it again? And we did. And she said, you know, that little one says that she wants to be invited anytime I do this. And I realized I had forgotten to do that myself, but that was a great idea. So what I'm pointing out to you is not only do we need these skills, but we need to be able to learn from our clients. And she was the perfect example of, of someone who was also an elementary school teacher, by the way, who helped me learn a great deal. Another technique that we used to help her stay present in the room when things were getting difficult was that I gave her this ball. And she could squeeze it, she could toss it from one hand to the other, or she could throw it at me. Sometimes she used a large throw pillow, and she was able to stay present for longer and longer periods. Eventually, we were able to get to target development and do some full EMDR protocols using these techniques, especially the conference room technique, so all the parts who wanted to come to the, to the targeting could be present. Over the years, it's worked out well for me and many other EMDR therapists who have been using these techniques. And I want to uh, tell you that I hope to be with you in March, and we'll discuss this in a broader format. Thank you, and au revoir.